Welcome to tonight's event for the Belfast International Arts Festival in partnership with Westival in Westport, County Mayo. Both festivals are delighted you could join us. My name is Richard Wakeley and I am the festival's artistic director and chief executive. Tonight we're screening a recent conversation with one of the nation's best loved broadcasters, Jenny Murray, in conversation with Alison Morris of the Irish News and discussing Jenny's new book, Fat Cow, Fat Chance about our relationship with food and weight. Dame Jenny Murray OBE is a journalist and broadcaster who presented BBC Radio 4's Women's Hour for 33 years before recently stepping down. Author of several books, including Memoirs of a Not-So-Dutiful Daughter, A History of Britain in 21 Women, and A History of the World in 21 Women, she is also the recipient of honorary doctorates in recognition of our contribution to broadcasting and writing. Jenny's books, including Fat Cow Fat Chance, are available in person or online from both New Alibi's Bookshop in Belfast and, T and Tertulia Bookshop in Westport. If you enjoy what you're seeing this evening, please consider joining us again for more wonderful literary conversations, including Jenny Offal, Scholastic Mukasonga and Nina Barari, and for our closing event on Sunday the 1st of November, a very special US presidential election special with Sarah Churchwell and Michelle Cressfield, hosted by our own Fintan O'Toole. For more information on all our events, please visit our website, www.belfastinternationalartsfestival.com. Thank you for watching and enjoy the screening. Welcome to the, the Belfast International Arts Festival. I'm Alison Morris. I'm a columnist with the Irish News and joining me today is Jenny Murray. Dame Jenny Murray is a much loved journalist and broadcaster who has presented BBC Radio 4's Women's Hour since 1987. She was made a dame in recognition of her contribution to broadcasting in 2011 and only recently announced that she will be leaving the programme in October this year. Jenny is the author of several books, including Memoirs of a Not-So-Dutiful Daughter, A History of Britain in 21 Women, and A History of the World in 21 Women. Originally from Yorkshire, she lives in North London and on the South Coast, and her latest book, Fat Cow, Fat Chance, looks at the science and psychology of size. Um, to start this, Jenny's just going to have a quick read through one of the sections of her book, and then we're going to have a chat about the book, which, as you can see, I have almost finished, just not quite. <laughs> Um, so, Jenny, do you want to take it off and, and read through the introduction? I'll just read the introduction, absolutely. I can't begin to tell you how many times I've been walking down the street, minding my own business, pottering along on my bike, or simply sitting in a queue of traffic at the wheel of my mini, when, apropos of absolutely nothing, I've heard that cow, that bitch, sometimes that C dot dot dot. Sorry, I can't really bring myself to actually write that one. Or, hey love, but where's all the pies? Every time it happened, I would try to convince myself I didn't care. Yes, for much of my adult life, I was substantially overweight, obese even, and had done every diet known to man or woman with no lasting success. I'd done my very best to persuade myself that it was possible to be fat and happy and that the people who loved me wouldn't cease to care just because the middle-aged spread had got somewhat out of control. By the time I was 64 years old, my weight had become quite crippling. I told myself my obesity had played no role in the breast cancer I'd been diagnosed with in 2006, almost certainly wrong, and that my need for a bilateral hip replacement had nothing to do with the strain I'd been putting on my joints. I put all the blame for the damage done to my bones on the chemotherapy I had after the cancer surgery. For so long, I'd wanted to join the ever-increasing groups of women, Dawn French, Joe Brand, Beth Ditto, Rebel Wilson, and most recently, Sophie Hagen, the author of Happy Fat, who argued it was possible to be fat and fit and were furious at the fat shaming that is so widespread. Hagen claims to have become completely at ease with taking up space in a world that wants to shrink him. The excuses I made to myself were legion. I was, I kept on telling myself, fat and happy, and I didn't care about the insults. The fat part was blatantly obvious. The happy, 
was an Oscar-winning performance put on in public. But in private, I lived with a growing sense of fear and misery that this incredible Hulk was my lot forevermore and would probably kill me long before I reached my three score years and ten. I did care, but for so long I tried to put all the worries to the back of my mind. I tended to avoid the scales and merrily ordered clothes online from the 1647 website owned by Dawn French and Ellen Teague, which boasts the biggest range of plus sizes in the UK. I wore only their baggiest tops in the most voluminous size along with a pair of stretchy leggings, always a slimming black in colour. I joked I'd managed to create a uniform for myself that made life so much easier in the morning. It was just like school days, I told myself. I didn't have to think about what I was going to wear. My mind could be occupied with more important thoughts than the frivolity of fashion. I simply needed to make sure there were plenty of the same types of items in the wardrobe, so all I had to do was pick out a clean outfit. Ordering online, of course, meant never having to go into a shop and face the disapproving glances of a sales assistant who doubted she would have anything in my size, and never having to endure the humiliation of a communal changing room. So I simply used the uniform to hide away all the abundant flesh and at the same time tried hard to become immune to what I was feeling about the constant insults. Two things shocked me into taking myself in hand. My old GP, who was also significantly overweight, retired. I guess I'd always used her as an excuse. If my doctor was fat, what did I have to worry about? She never made me step on the scales and I don't recall her ever suggesting weight loss might be a good idea. I should perhaps point out that like me, she also had breast cancer, in her case, twice. My new GP is a man. He's quite elderly and never pulls his punches. He suggested I step on the scales at our first appointment. The scales groaned. And so did I when I saw the reason why. 24 stones. How on earth had I allowed that to happen? My doctor's question was, what did I propose to do about it? The second shock came when my son Charlie accompanied me and my three little dogs on a walk in the local park. My walks tended to be slow, painful and rather lumbering, with frequent pauses at the benches. We were having a little sit down when an enormous woman passed us driving a mobility scooter. Her two dogs trotted along beside her, their leads attached to the handlebar. Why me mum, said Charlie, his voice full of concern. If you aren't careful, that'll be you before long. It was the prompt I needed to do something about it. This book tells the story of how I took that fat chance, lost eight stones in less than a year, and how my weight has now stabilized. <clears throat> this book tells the story of how I took that fat chance, lost eight stones in less than a year, and how my weight has now stabilized as I've developed a healthy relationship with food without losing the pleasure I take in eating it. It also asked why... <coughs> Sorry, animals. I was going to say, was that a little dog? <laughs> <laughs> it's fine, dogs, children, people, everyone's welcome at the, the festival, so I think it's all right. <laughs> no, I'll just carry on. Really well jump across the table at some point. Um, it, it also asks why obesity is the health crisis it has become and explains how the food and diet industries have done us anything but good. I hope the second part of the book's title indicates a new interpretation of the expression fat chance, no longer a negative but a positive opportunity to get well again at a healthy weight. I've kept the fat cow in the first part because the stigma directed at so many of us simply has to be tackled. It was not until I attended a symposium on obesity and stigma in 2017 that one of the speakers, Dr. Stuart Flint, made a point that opened my eyes to what those of us who suffer from obesity have to endure. Hate speech, he said, is illegal and a number of conditions are covered by the law. 
expressions of hatred towards someone on account of the person's color, race, disability, nationality, ethnic or national origin, religion, gender identity or sexual orientation are illegal. Any communication which is threatening or abusive and is intended to harass, alarm or distress someone is forbidden. The penalties for hate speech include fines, imprisonment or both. However, he paused. You will note there is one common condition which frequently induces what I would describe as hate speech that is not included in that list. And that condition is obesity. It was a really profound moment for me. A light bulb began to flash in my brain, prompting me to do something to spread the word that fat shaming is hate speech, even though it's not included in the statute. For the person who hears it, it's insulting and deeply distressing. People will often justify calling out to the fat cow, making the assumption that whilst it's impossible and undesirable to change your colour, race, disability or chosen gender identity, the fat person should want to change their physical form and indeed could change it if they weren't so greedy and lazy. You'll often hear the mantra, take less energy in and put more energy out. Most thin people who haven't suffered the struggle with a body that refuses to conform to what's thought to be the norm, slimness, assume you can successfully go on a regime of diet and exercise and no longer be an obese, sick drain on the NHS, suffering from type two diabetes, heart trouble, and some cancers. It's worth pointing out at this stage that even thin people have diabetes, cancer and cardiac arrest, but you wouldn't think so from the daily diet of news stories describing an obesity epidemic. Over the past year alone, I have counted hundreds of headlines in various newspapers warning of the risks and general downside of becoming overweight. Generation fat, 40% of young are overweight. Children who are obese at 11 being doomed to an early death. Diabetes cases double in just 20 years. Britons eating 50% more than they say. And on and on and on it goes. Obesity is the new smoking. New war on junk food. Skipping breakfast is making children fat. Huge health risks of high BMI. Pill that expands in stomach, doubles weight loss chance. Okay, enough, you get the picture. My intention in writing this book is to explain what it feels like to be fat and how incredibly difficult it is to lose the weight, no matter how hard you try. I'll also try to unpick the complex new scientific discoveries that explain why going on a diet is rarely the answer to the fat girl or boy's problems. In recent years, science has come on a pace to increase understanding of the genetic, environmental, evolutionary and metabolic reasons why some of us can eat as many chips as we choose without putting on an ounce. And some of us will balloon if we dare to walk past a chippy and merely sniff without consuming so much as one fry. I would like to think that people who read this book and discuss its contents will begin to understand why Fat shaming is so hurtful, harmful, and cruel. The stigma often makes fat people withdraw into themselves to the extent they're too afraid even to go to a doctor to discuss the problem and inquire what solutions there might be. My aim is never ever to hear any passing stranger call out fat cow to anyone, never again. Thank you, Jenny. And I have been reading your book on what I find really interesting. At the start, I thought, what is this going to be? Is it talking about diets? Is it, you know, looking at, at the journey that all of us sit as women when we're with our friends and discuss? But you really did get into the science of it. But to go right back to the beginning of it, that started in your childhood. And I have to say, those early chapters when you were writing about your childhood and your mother and your grandmother, I was starving reading them because your descriptions of all the lovely food, I thought, if this book is meant to make me lose weight, it's not working. Because every time I read them, I thought, oh, I would love that. That sounds gorgeous. Um, and you can see the food was such a big part of your childhood. 
um, it was something that was to be celebrated. And as you said, it was a sign of, a sign when you talk about that sort of post-war generation, it was a sign that you were doing well, that things were recovering, you know, that you were well off, that you were able to put three good meals on the table a day. But do you think that that maybe had started your, your sort of, um, your disassociation between food and mood and all of those things that goes right back, does it? Do you, do you believe until our childhood? I really try not to blame my mother and my grandmother for the dilemma that I found myself growing into because I, I you know, I was a big baby. I was big when I was born, um, but I wasn't fat. And sometimes I wonder if the reason I didn't get fat on this amazing food that they used to cook was because my grandfather was a wonderful gardener and a lot of what came in the vegetable and fruit side of things was homegrown, which he had managed to produce. Everything was fresh, everything was quite lightly cooked. And he was also a great fan of Gorgonzola, this grandfather of mine. And what we're beginning to learn now is that the microbiome the, the bugs that we have naturally in our stomachs, if we eat the right kind of food, actually help us not to put on fat. So I suspect when I was a child, I didn't get fat. I got fat when I left home and went to university, which is absolutely classic. Um, but, you know, the other thing that I think I never learned to do as a child was really control my appetite. Susie Orbach, whose work, Fat is a Feminist Issue, has been a great thing for me all my life. I read it when I was very young. And one of the things that she says is, you know, listen to your appetite. And when it tells you you're full, stop. And for years and years and years, I've said, yeah, that's a really good idea. But it's the one subject yeah, on which I am profoundly deaf. And I think that's because... My mother and grandmother, this post-war generation who had suddenly could get sugar, could get butter, could get all the good things for making cakes and Yorkshire puddings and all of that sort of thing. They would spend all their time shopping, cooking, cleaning the house, making everything wonderful as an expression of their love for their family. But you have a huge great plate of food because big portions were the thing, you know, we can afford it. This is, we're, we're not poor, we're not destitute. Um, and I would get halfway through it and say, oh, mom, you know, I, no, I'm really full. And she'd say, no, I've spent all morning cooking that for you and it's really good. And you will clear that plate. Yeah, and yeah. if I didn't clear it at lunch, it would be there in the evening and she would make me eat it then. So very early as a child, I learned that to please my mother and my grandmother and appreciate what they had done, I had to eat the lot. And I think that's a terrible thing to do to a child because learning to understand your own appetite is part of the trick to not getting fat. It is, and I mean, and when I think back, your mother reminded me in some ways of my mother who's still alive and who I love dearly, but. Big Alice can throw out an insult and make it sound like a compliment at the best of times. Um, there's times I often joke, you'd go into your house and she would look you up and down and say, have you started eating bread again? That's like my mother's way of telling you you're putting on weight. Um, but, th but that generation of women, I think that's just how they speak and they think they're doing us a favor. Um, and that, you know, if I don't tell you the truth, who will? If your own mother can't speak to you honestly. Um, and especially then when I went into a job in the media, just as you were saying, when your mother would have seen you rather than comment on the content or what you had done or the intellectual ability of you being there, you know, and interviewing these people, the comments were almost always about how you looked. Yeah. Uh, yes. I mean, I remember presenting Newsnight, which, you know, finished quite late at night. I would go into the office when the programme was over, the phone would ring and it would be my mother and she'd say, I'd say, oh, what do you think of that interview I did with whichever prominent politician of the time? And she said, oh, I'm sorry, love, I wasn't really listening to what you were saying, but uh, you know that red top you had on? Well, it's a bit highly coloured for your complexion. Um, and uh, it, you really need to get 
your fringe cut because you know your eyes are your best feature and and we can't really see them and well, have you put on a bit of weight again <laughs> constant <laughs> constant constant i never walked into my mother's house without her saying either oh my goodness you've lost so much weight you look so skinny or oh love come on you know you need to go on a diet you need to lose some of that weight because my weight went up and down up and down up and down until really my middle age and that's when it just went up and up and up and up despite whatever diet I was on and I did them all you when you when you left to go to university obviously as with most people your diet then goes to the wall you're socializing drinking much more probably eating rubbish because it's cheap and it's easy and all of those sort of things and we know that these are the perils that a lot of young people find themselves in, especially if they haven't been taught to cook before they go to university. But when you had described, and I'd listened to what weight you were then, you weren't overweight at all, but yet a doctor in the university prescribed well, you. Well, I, I was, I was. I mean, I was nine and a half stone when I went to university and I'm five foot seven. So that was a really reasonable weight. Yeah. After most of the first year, I'd gone up to 11 and a half stone. So that was a lot. Uh, I now don't consider it particularly heavy. My goodness. Like, but I am five foot I, seven, and if I was 11 and a half stone, I would be delighted with myself at this point in time. Um, well, but it is that, that we always say, I wish I was as fat as the first time I thought I was fat. You know that? Because as young people, we consider half stone overweight to be fat, when yeah. in reality, probably well, at five foot seven, you probably look quite, you could carry 11 and a half stone, no problem. But you see, what happened in that case was, I don't think I'd even noticed that I was getting fat. You know, you look at yourself in the mirror, it's just the same old face, you don't really think about it. But my parents had been working, my father had been working abroad and my mother was with him. And they decided, they were in Turkey and they decided to come home. They'd drive across Europe, pick up a ferry and get off at Hull, which is where I was at university. So I said, yeah, great, fine, I'll come down and meet you from the boat and you can come and see where I'm living and all of that. They drove straight past me and I was waving like crazy. And my father stopped the car and he jumped out and gave me a big hug. My mother did not move. She just sat there. And so I got in the car and she turned around and said, good Lord, what on earth's happened to you? You look like a baby elephant. That was my mother's greeting after she'd been away for nearly a year. And we had the most tremendous row. She didn't want to come and see where I was living. She just wanted to be driven home to Barnsley. She rang me that night and said, well, your father was very upset because we'd had such a row. Um, we had a little bit of a shunt with the car at Selby on the way back. So I hope you're proud of yourself. And, and I was just devastated absolutely devastated so I went to the university health center and saw a young doctor and I said look you know I've put on a lot of weight I need to do something about it and he said oh that's all right I can help you I can give you some tablets that will help you lose weight so off I went and I very rapidly began to lose weight and I'd also seen in a magazine that a good way of dieting was to eat nothing but boiled eggs and tomatoes that's all you had at every meal, a boiled egg and a tomato. I, to this day, could not eat a plate, contents of a plate that had both a tomato and a boiled egg on them. I can eat boiled eggs and I can eat tomatoes, but it never. Reminded, it reminded me, reading it, of, do you remember that awful egg and grapefruit diet? I mean, I, like yourself, probably can remember every diet going, the cabbage soup one and all those, but we had to just eat eggs and grapefruit for two weeks. Of course you're going to bloody lose weight, just eat eggs and grapefruit. Of exactly. course you're going to. Well, mine was eggs and tomato. <laughs> and uh, so I kept losing weight. And then one day my tutor, who was a lovely, lovely man, said, look, Jenny, I really need to talk to you. He said, you've lost so much weight and you're very up and down. Your work's not as good as it was when you came here. And I don't know what's wrong. What are you on? And I said, hmm. I mean, this was 1968, 69. And um, I said, oh, I'm not on anything. I don't take any drugs. I haven't even smoked a joint. And he said, no, but you're taking something. What is it? And I said, well, all I'm taking is these pills that the doctor gave me. 
He said, come on, show them to me. So I took them out of my bag. And he said, oh my goodness, they are black bombers. <laughs> I said, <laughs> what? <laughs> he said, they're really powerful amphetamines. And that's why you're not eating at all. That's why you're losing so much weight. Their appetite is depressant. And that's why you're so up and down. So I had to be taken into the health centre for a fortnight. I had gone down to just seven stone. So I was verging on anorexia. And I really had to be taught to eat again. And then John, the tutor, said, look, what I suggest you do is go home for the summer to your mother. <laughs> so... Uh, I, I managed to do the exams and, and get through that and finish the first year and then did go home to my mother, whose reaction when the door opened was, oh my goodness, what's happened to you? You're so thin, you look so ill. Like, come on, I'll feed you up. So she did feed me very well. And, and for a long time then, I sort of managed to keep it off by being really, really careful. And then, you know, I started working, I had the kids. I came to be working in London um, on, on Woman's Hour. That started in 1987 when my second son was pretty newborn. And I'd worked on Newsnight, I'd worked on the Day programme and then went to Woman's Hour. And I, my family had moved up north to the Peak District so that the boys could go to Manchester Grammar School. And so I rented a flat, which I, I call Wuthering Depths because it was a basement flat in Camden Town. And, you know, I had lots of friends in London, but they were all occupied with their kids and families and everything. So we'd go out occasionally, but I spent an awful lot of time in that flat on my own eating rubbish. You know, I'd order takeaways, I'd nip down to the supermarket, bring pizzas, I drank far too much dry white wine, uh, which for a long time quite a number of us treated like a non-alcoholic drink. It has been the story of my lockdown. While everybody else was stocking up on loo rolls, I was like, we're down to the last two bottles of wine. Yep. There's an emergency situation here, somebody sort of out. And, and you know, and it's, my way, it's an easy habit to get into, though, isn't it? It is a very easy habit to go into. And I, you know, I was lonely. I really missed my husband. I missed my kids. But I was the breadwinner by, by that stage. Um, and then, of course, Woman's Hour moved to the morning instead of being on at two o'clock in the afternoon. So you'd get up even earlier. A whole extra meal would be added into the day. Um, and I just, ballooned. I really did balloon. And I did the Atkins diet, I did the Ducan diet, I did the cabbage soup diet, I did everything and you'd lose a bit. You'd think, oh great, you know, this is going really well. And then what I've learned from studying the science is those kind of diets, unless you're the sort of person who can be absolutely rigid about eating virtually nothing, really, it will all come back on because your genetics fight against it, your hormones fight against it. And as you come to the point where you're beginning to think, oh, I've cracked this, you know, I can, I can start to eat a little bit more normally again. Your body makes you phenomenally hungry. That's happened to me so many times. I find that so interesting because the same, I mean, I, I was never as a, a child and as a teenager, I was skinny, scrawny little thing. And then it was only after I had my children and changed jobs. So I would have always did a job where I was on my feet. I went back to school quite late and became a journalist. And that is a very, you know, apart from the fact you're out and about on jobs, a lot of that is sitting down and it's writing. And that it was when I noticed that my body changed shape completely because my lifestyle changed shape completely. And I could really relate to a lot of what you were saying about, you know, there is science too, and the fact that if you're working those strange shifts and long hours, you know, you're up from early in the morning, as you say, you're adding in an extra meal and your body doesn't understand whether it's night or day. It doesn't matter. And all of that I found really interesting because it was an insight into, to partly into to my eating and also my relationship with food. I love food and I love cooking and I love the pleasure 
But you see, that, that's the problem. You know, if you're a drug addict or you're a smoker or an alcoholic, you can convince yourself, yeah, I can crack this because I actually don't really need these things. You don't need the alcohol. You don't need the cigarettes. You don't need the drugs. Food is something else. We, <laughs> without it, we die. So not only do we need it to keep ourselves alive, but look at the pleasure it gives us and look at the food pornography that surrounds us. Every time you turn on the telly, there's somebody there cooking something absolutely amazing. Or you open a women's magazine, there's some fantastic Mary Berry cake that you think, oh yes, I could just fancy that. And you actually go in the kitchen and you make it. And then you have to eat it, and oh, all of it. It. but it's lo all of it probably. <laughs> but it's lovely. It's pleasurable, and you know, I remember doing the Weight Watchers diet for a while, and this woman who was my advisor, um, I was asking her, you know, what kind of things can you actually eat, and what what can't you eat? She said, Well, really, you can eat anything. Should but you know, if if you want to eat spaghetti, for instance. Take the, the dried spaghetti out of the packet, get a 5p piece, and just have the, the amount of spaghetti which covers a 5p piece when, it, when it's standing on it. Can you imagine? The I actually laughed out loud at that. You should see. I mean, I don't eat pasta anymore because I've been conditioned to think it's the devil. But when I did, it would have been a bowl of pasta, you know, that you could have climbed up. You know, you need a Sherpa to get to the top of it. I mean, the, the thought of this piddly little bit that you would feed to like a toddler of, of pasta trying to sustain, you know, a full grown person. And why would bother? You see, the people that, there, there are some people who do have success on these kind of diets, the, the ketone thing and Weight Watchers, but, but you know, all the research shows that 95% of us who appear to have gone on a successful diet will put it all back on. And it's only the ones who have some sort of ruthless concentration and determination who think about it every minute of the day. You know, how much can I eat? What can I eat? What can't I eat? And that's so tough. As, as a, a woman in the media, and obviously your career and what you're known for best is women's are, and it is being on the radio, but that wasn't always the case. And then a lot of times you have done a lot of broadcast and television work. And um, when you're in that world, you realize that almost everyone is tiny, like beyond tiny. And I know that people would say that, they used to say, I remember someone saying, oh, the TV will put three pounds on you. And I'm like, it's gotta be more than that because that's not what I look like in real life. Yeah. <laughs> it's gotta be three stone, it puts three stone on you. But to see yourself back, it's not a natural thing, you know, to watch yourself back on a television. So I don't do it anymore. I've just stopped doing it because I just find it so depressing. And I've also noticed that people who have done it for a long period of time, they modify and change themselves so much because they're so conscious of their looks. But as you say, you know, you could be interviewing a politician, you could be doing something that is so worthy, you know, proper, you know, journalism that could change things and hold people to account. And yet people are looking to see what size dress you're wearing. Yeah. I think, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and did you find out when you went went into the media that you did you ever feel that you were judged because of your size or that your job? Well, because I, 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 you know, I was not that fat when I was working yeah. in in television a lot. I would go up and down a little bit, which my mother would always notice. Mm -hmm. um, but it was later, and <laughs> I mean, that's the sort of um, I love radio. I love presenting radio programs, um, but it 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 does allow you not to worry too much about the way you look because yeah. they can't see you you know i mean the delight of presenting the today program and woman's hour and knowing my mother could listen and actually she would have to be listening to what i was saying because she couldn't see me but that's dangerous kind of the, the, obviously the sad part of, of this is you went to speak to women who had battled with their weight and those stories were really sad because you know, one person, her whole entire worth and her marriage was based on her weight. I find it really sad listening to the very young girl who was already, you know, you could see her whole life ahead of her was just going to be plagued with thoughts about what size she was. And we live in a very different world for teenagers than you lived in and, or that I lived in. And in my generation, 
and everything that is on social media and their lives are so image conscious and image led and everything is filtered and everybody who they look up to is highly filtered um, and it's so damaging for them as people. Do you think that, I mean, what do you find out in the science of this, the science of food and the science of weight loss? Do you believe that that's something that should be being taught in schools and taught to young people at a very early age before they get to the point where it becomes a problem in their life? We need to have much more understanding. You know, some people are just naturally bigger than others. The reason I wrote this book was, I, I, and I can't be part of the fat positivity movement, is because I know how dangerous real obesity is. You know, I did have breast cancer. I did have to have my hips replaced. Um, I was verging on type 2 diabetes, which is not a pleasant condition to have. Um, and so I wanted people to understand the science of it, how complicated it is for some people to do it, and to try and encourage people to do something if they really are becoming dangerously obese. Um, you know, yeah, the NHS spends a lot of money on it, um, on treating the things that obesity causes. And what I did in the end, um, I decided to have the surgery. And I'm not a great advocate of gastric bands because I know a lot of people who've had them, they've gone to have them done abroad because they're cheaper abroad and they've been quite painful. You know, they just band around the top of the stomach to reduce the amount that will actually go through. Um, some of them have actually melted chocolate so they can pour it down, you know. Whereas the operation that I had, I, I found a wonderful surgeon. Um, he's called Professor Francesco Rubino. And he's Italian, but he's worked in America. And then he now works here. He's the first professor of what he calls metabolic surgery rather than bariatric surgery, because the metabolism plays such an important role in all of this. And he did, I mean, I was told, look, he's the best guy because he's the best surgeon. He's also, more importantly, the best researcher. And he had found when he was working in America, um, he said, you know, when he first started, he thought, oh God, I don't want to work on fat people. You know, they are just lazy and, and greedy. And it was doing the work and researching it that made him realize that absolutely was not the case. And he was doing some operations with people who had rampaging type two diabetes and were seriously obese. And he said he noticed very quickly after the surgery, they no longer had type two diabetes, even before they'd lost very much weight. And that led him to start really researching the meta metabolism. And the, the operation that I had is called a gastric sleeve, which sounds very dramatic, 80% of my stomach was removed. I only have teeny weeny little scars left. You can hardly notice them because they do it all with, what is it? Cable. Yeah, cable surgery, yeah. <laughs> that would look evil. Um, and they then uh, suit it up, obviously. Um, but what's good about that one is the part of the stomach that's taken away is the part of the stomach that contains a little hormone called ghrelin. And the ghrelin is the hunger hormone. It's the one when you've lost loads of weight on your diet and you suddenly become ravenously hungry. It's the one sending messages up to the brain saying, oh my goodness, she's starving, she's starving, make her eat, make her eat, make her eat. And that of course is connected to the genetics because somewhere in my dim and distant past, there must have been a group of people who lived in an area where there was famine, there was starvation, and the ones who survived were the ones who were able to retain fat. So they were eating very little, but at least they stayed alive. The ones who didn't have that capacity were the ones who died. So that's part of the genetic involvement in it. You even did that surgery, obviously, with your eyes open. You did lots of research. I know that you originally had went to the NHS and then decided, which I think you thought was quite ironic to use your mother's inheritance to pay for, for this, 
the surgery. Um, yeah. It's ten thousand pounds to have it done because the NHS and whether this will change since Boris Johnson has been talking more about obesity and said at the outset when he was talking about it, we really should be looking at doing more of these operations because they are so successful. Um, but at the time I went for it, I mean, I was 64, I'm 70 now. Um, it was really difficult. You had to keep going to courses and have people lecture you about diet, like I needed lectures about diet. No, I didn't. Um, and so in the end, I thought the only way I'm going to get this done quickly, because at my age, I need to get it done quickly, um. Um, is to pay for it myself. So yeah, my mother had died. Um, and hadn't left me a big inheritance. My parents were not wealthy. My father had died as well. And I thought actually she would be delighted for me <laughs> to use part of the inheritance I got from her on losing weight. And that's what I did. Just to, I'm going to get a step back because I think it's, it's important. I know you sort of touched on what the doctor had said about Americans and thinking people are just lazy. But there is a part in the book, which is very true, where you had said about people speak to overweight people as though they are stupid. And it doesn't matter whether they're a professor or whether they have a PhD or whatever their job they're in, people speak to people who are grossly overweight as though they're in some way stupid or thick or, you know, too stupid. To, and that is, and then I noticed you talked with one of your friends who lost a lot of weight, who spoke about how men spoke to her very differently. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they wanted to listen to what she said because she was no longer overweight. I find that, the science and psychology of that, how we've been conditioned to the way yeah. people live. I get really irritated now when I meet people who I haven't seen for a while. And the first thing they say was, oh, you look great. My goodness, you've lost so much weight. And I just want to say, so what are you saying? I was a ugly bag. <laughs> <laughs> I don't say it, um, but it really annoys me that your weight is the first thing that people want to comment on. And yes, a lot of people do treat you as stupid. And what's most worrying about this, you know, this whole fat shaming thing where we've had journalists, leading journalists like Piers Morgan saying, well, of course we should be fat shaming people because if you fat shame them, they'll only have one hamburger rather than three, won't they? And of course that is simply not true because patterns of people's hunger are very different because of the signs of what's going on in their body. But James Corden, when all of this was being spoken about a couple of years ago, said, look, hang on, you know, if, if fat shaming worked, there wouldn't be a fat child in school. And there are, it's much more complicated than that. And and there's also, and I've noticed recently with the massive weight loss of Adele, that prior to that, she was lovely, friendly Adele, unthreatening Adele, you know, Adele, the lovely, cuddly, sort of chubby singer. And since she has lost weight, you've noticed some quite vicious comments to her online because now she is a very thin woman and therefore it's almost as if her personality must have changed overnight. She's not this nice person anymore. She's some sort of, you know, nasty vixen who's accused of all sorts of things. But I mean, the amount of, of talk about even, you know, her weight from one size to the other. You know, you go from fat shaming someone to thin shaming them after they, they manage to lose their weight. And her weight loss came about after divorce. And so she's probably fairly miserable. You know, I doubt very much of that weight loss happened because she was so happy all of a sudden. I, I really don't know what happened to her, but I do know that there's so much research been done about the impact of fat shaming, the, the stigma of fat shaming particularly on children. You know, there's a woman in America, uh, Professor Poole, who's spent years researching this and has found that overweight children never get invited to be part of a sports team. They're, they're just ignored. Um, they, their academic performance becomes worse and they withdraw into themselves. They really withdraw into themselves to the extent that I said in the introduction that so many people who are shamed because they're fat just withdraw to the extent that they won't even go out and maybe ask somebody what kind of surgery could I have you know what kind of thing will work because you know this whole business that the NHS is talking about at the moment of putting people on these drinks these 800 calories a day drinks 
what worries me about that is, yeah, it might work for three months. But I spoke to the professor who did the work in Newcastle and I said, what percentage have kept the weight off for two years or more? more? And the percentage is very, very low because, of course, that kind of ravaging diet, you come to the end and your little grellings are going up to your brain to say, oh, she's starving, she's starving, make her eat. It's so unsustainable and we know that and so your surgery has been really successful and obviously you're one you're someone now who would advocate for that and say that that should be used as a, as a treatment for a lot of these conditions um, rather than force people into it as a last resort it should you know i i consider obesity now is a, a disease this ease that's what it is um and it is extremely difficult to control partly because the food industry has done us no favors in you know the kind of food that is easily available especially in poorer areas is really not the kind of food that is going to do you any good it's full of sugar and salt and horrible horrible things and i think if we're really going to take this problem seriously and improve people's health when they become obese Spending money on the operations is the right way to do it. When I had breast cancer, nobody balked at the feeling that the NHS might have to spend money on giving me a mastectomy. Oh, she's got cancer, give her a mastectomy, get rid of it. Nobody balks at that. So why can we not see obesity as a disease in the same way as we would see the breast cancer or the dodgy hips that needed to be replaced that's what medicine is for, is to ease the disease that we are suffering from. In and when world. you decided you decided to write this book, obviously it's, it's a book that looks at the science. Is it something that you hope that people who had maybe had a life of yo-yo diet and such as yourself would realise that they're not at fault or to blame, that there is you a science it. behind it? The thing is with the operations, as I said, it cost me £10,000 to do it privately. When a friend who's a Radio 4 producer in science actually sat down and tried to work out the cost benefit of doing those operations, she's much better at science and maths than I am. And she worked out that when you compare the cost of looking after somebody with type 2 diabetes over a long period, which you have to if they keep being ill with it, you compare that with the £10,000 you spend on the operation, the operation pays for itself within three years. Yeah, but it's not considered an essential surgery because people speak about it as though it was something that was caused themselves. Whereas you say, we don't not treat cancer patients by saying you probably did something in your life that caused that yourself. Yeah. You know, if somebody's fallen down skiing or driving a motor car very fast like they were yesterday and crashing all over the place and they need to go to hospital nobody says oh no we can't afford to treat you you brought this on yourself yeah. um and so i noticed that you're not wearing your uniform black you're now wearing very bright blue this is nice <laughs> i like this <laughs> i do love blue um and so at this stage do you think your weight has now stabilized that your band has been successful and you're now at the as uh, i went from 24 stones to 14 stones and then i started to remember people saying to me years ago darling when you get older don't sacrifice your face for the sake of your body and I kept thinking about Nigel Lawson, and I know it's awful to keep mentioning him, but you know, he was massive when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer. And then he went on this amazing diet and he lost tons and tons and tons of weight. And his face kind of collapsed. He was just one big collapsed wrinkle. Um, and so I got to the 14 stone and I thought, actually, your face still looks okay. Don't make any effort to lose any more weight. So I, I now eat anything I like, including bread, including pasta, but I forcibly eat small portions. I always have my, my 
I've got two massive sons. They're not fat, but they're big. My husband is tall. He's not fat either. But he's a little bit fatter since lockdown. He's got a bit of a belly belly. <laughs> Never mind about that. Um, and uh, I have a small plate and they all have huge plates and they eat their huge plates and I eat exactly the same food but in a very small portion and I'm very quickly full and every so often I can't finish it and so they grab my plate and finish it for me so no food gets wasted. Yeah and so you had sons you never had a daughter to see whether or not you would be better at speaking to them about weight problems than your own mother was. I have daughters and I'm very conscious not to say things to them and if I sometimes do they say why are you getting on like big Alice, which is my mother. So I'm told very quickly not to mention anything about their look, their looks or, or their weight. How have you found lockdown? Well, it was interesting because we sold our house up in the Peak District the, a year ago. And one of our sons, who's a vet, works in the New Forest with his um, fiance now, who's a doctor. Um, and David and I had met, my husband and I, when we were, I was working in Southampton and he was in the Navy and we loved the area around Lymington, you know, that whole coast there. So we decided we'd buy a place down there, but we didn't want to rush into it. So we thought, right, we'll rent a house in Lymington and spend the time finding the house that we really want to buy. And that was last September, just a year ago. And I was going up and down and he was coming up and down so we could see each other while I was still doing one of that. And then the lockdown came and I had to stay here and he had to stay there. <laughs> and I was all right because I can't eat vast amounts of food. Yeah. And I think he down there on his own <laughs> was going a bit mad. And uh, yeah, we're going to have to do something about that when it's all <laughs> over and done with. And um, so have you, you plans for when you, you finally finish? Um, you finish I up have, time? but I'm not yet allowed to speak about them. So, so um, you're certainly not going for a retirement and heading out to the garden. You've obviously got something, something planned then. No, I'm not. He's <laughs> getting very keen on the garden um, yeah. and that's fine by me. I love having a lovely garden, but I'm not much of a gardener. I just like to look at it and hope somebody else has cut the lawn. No, I imagine you're someone who needs to keep mentally active as well as physically active, so you're not ready for retirement yet. So not we'll watch this space and see what you're, you're moving on to then. Yeah, all, all my friends who are now in their late 70s, their 80s, the ones who are still really sharp and doing really well are the ones who've carried on working. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good a good um, thing to, to, to leave us on. I, I agree that I worked the entire way through lockdown and while it wasn't ideal working from, from the house, who knew you could put a newspaper out from, the, from your own homes that you can. But I felt sorry for anyone who didn't have something to keep them mentally active that whole time because I think it would have been a very long and very sad and very depressing mm -hmm. thing. Uh, you know, I mean, looking around in London, because I was I was going in to the BBC to present women's yeah. so, um, I was out all the time. And, you know, looking at young parents with small children, primary school children, living in blocks of flats with no garden, no park around them. I, I don't know how they stay the same. I really don't. Oh, I know. And I think that we'll be dealing with the, the social fallout from that from such a long time in the future when we actually see the real horror stories that came out of that time in lockdown, be it people's mental health, young children living in unsuitable conditions, education, all those things, which are just the kind of subjects that you as a journalist and moments are, would be getting your teeth into, I'm sure when you could <laughs> You get back now that we're looking at the post-lockdown period or possibly another one. Listen, Jenny, it's been fascinating speaking. You have a big, big fan of women's art for most of my life. I was delighted that my friends were very jealous when I told them today that I was coming to come to speak to you. Unfortunately, it's in very unusual circumstances and we're looking, at, we're looking at each other's houses instead of looking at each other. Um, hopefully by next year, maybe they'll be able to get back and we'll have a, a lovely sit down in Belfast somewhere and then maybe a very small 
plate and a glass of a wine. Very small plate. Yeah, it's lucky that small plates are in fashion these days, isn't it? <laughs> Half hours are in fashion. We'll do well. Listen, and thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.